unaussprechlichen Rampen. My name is Marco Visconti, and through this podcast I will invite fellow magicians, occultists, artists, and mystics to rumble along with them and my supporters on Patreon. By doing so, I hope to introduce you all to a much wider perspective on magic and what we get nowadays from occult social media, which is frankly beginning to feel very stale, repetitive, and uninspired. If you want to be part of one of the next episodes, join us on Patreon at patreon.com slash Marco Visconti by pledging at the Yezod tier or above. And now, on with the unspeakable rumbles. I don't even know how to pronounce this. Is The name that I chose for this format is Unersprechlichen Rumblen. Exactly. <laughs> That's the, exactly uh, the, 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 the reaction I wanted. Um, I found shunts. <laughs> exactly correct. Uh, as you can see, uh, Mr. Horfus is already uh, on, on us with the call, and uh, more people join. Um, you all know the, the, the format of these live streams, these meetups we do every week. Uh, this week we've done three so far, and there's going to be one more uh, waiting for us on Sunday. So it's going to be it's been an intense week. Good. Wow. Yeah, we do a lot of things. Um, but uh, I think that this is more or less what we're gonna have on the call for now. Of course, the call is being recorded, double checking after oh, two weeks ago. Uh, <laughs> yes, okay, it is recording. Um, I will keep, uh, when I always start talking, like I will keep me and Ron, uh, can, can, I, can I spotlight both of us? One, I think, we'll see. Uh, if not, uh, just, just look at us, we're here, that's it, on the top. Um, for those of you who are on the call, uh, you will be more than happy to uh, to ask questions after uh, I finish grilling Rodney. Uh, and as usual, um, you don't have to write the questions in the chat. Feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question straight away. Um, ideally, this would have been done would have done in a I don't know in a community center on a pub pub function. Oh God. I know that <laughs> you're gonna laugh at that. We're gonna get there. Why you're running laughing? We're gonna get there. Um, but in, for now, uh, we're still we're, we're still working in COVID time, and so we're gonna do it with, via Zoom. But the thing is that whenever I open the floor for questions, feel free to ask your questions. I mean, maybe there will be a little bit of moderation, one person first, but you very well behaved all the time. So uh, I don't have to. Uh, don't embarrass me in front of our first guest. That's it. Go do please embarrass him. <laughs> no. It makes it far more interesting. Uh, the good thing is that um, we, we, have, we have people from over the world tonight, as usual. And that's, that's better than meeting in a pub in Glastonbury, after all, or in London, or in Dublin. We're going to get there eventually. Anyway, our first guest for this new format of me introducing uh, interesting people, very interesting people of uh, the wider culture, is Mr. Rodney Orpheus. And Rodney, I mean, I've been friends with Rodney for a decade now. Um, I, I was, wrote... <laughs> maybe a little strong, Marco. I know, right? <laughs> um, I for... has it really been a decade? Yeah, it has. <laughs> it has. Oh my god! Yeah, we were young and beautiful, wow. and now we are old and beautiful. That's beautiful, anyway. So uh, Rodney is uh, Rodney is the living history of magic and of music as well. But tonight we're going to look at, look at magic for, and I'm going to say a little bit of music as well. Um, he is, uh, well, he's the lead singer uh, of the 80s, 90s uh, golf band, the Cassandra Complex. He used to play guitar for the Sisters of Mercy as well. And I he, did not. I oh, did not play the guitar for the Sisters of Mercy. you do that? I'm a terrible guitar player. I mean, there's a guitar oh, back you, there, you, but you, you, are, you, are in the you never ever want to hear me play it. Trust me. It, my own band won't allow me to play guitar anymore because it's so embarrassing. <laughs> no, well, I, I operated the computers for the Sisters of Mercy. I was, if, if you're a Sisters of Mercy fan, I was Dr. Avalanche. Okay, uh, all right, that's it. Uh, see, who's uh, cr credited on the back of all the records, Dr. Avalanche. Well, I was what's called the nurse because Dr. Avalanche is actually a drum machine. And so the person who operates it is called Dr. Avalanche's nurse. So that was my official job in the system mercy. I was you know, I was the nurse for Dr. Avalanche. I always knew you as the one of the git of the many guitar players of the sisters. So no, that... no, no. I was not hell no. Yeah, the sisters had a couple of great guitar players. I certainly could never. Anyway, we're getting off the subject. 
Uh, Rodney also became well. well yeah. Thank you, Rianne. <laughs> uh, as a it, very, very, touring very... with the sisters was just. So I mean, uh, we, we, we will get there because there's a lot of things we want to cover. Also, one, before we move into magic, another, um, I mean, Rodney Wood is also a, one of the most prolific uh, electronic producers. Um, a lot of music that you might have heard in the 90s was pretty much produced by Rodney, like Future Sound of London, for instance, uh, was produced by Rodney. So, yeah, uh, is, this is where you think where. Uh, there was a time in, well, there was a time back in the days, I think, where a lot of the music that we like collectively, most of, especially most of us who like electronic and goth music, was go, went to, uh, hand in hand with, with magic. Now, Rodney also, um, well, he's been a telemite all, all his life, really, mm -hmm. and uh, started in the 70s, if I'm not mistaken, and then... And I'm so old! <laughs> this, this, this is a really long, long, long way of saying... Rodney is really fucking old. Oh, you look fat. <laughs> of the secret Thanks, age. Marco. <laughs> um, and uh, Rodney, of course, became uh, um, well one of the top leaders of the OTO, uh, one of the um, elusive nine degrees of the OTO. So definitely, he knows the lemma uh, very well. Um, uh, eventually, in the in the recent years, we just moved to greener pastures, all of us. But we're all telemites, and mm -hmm. since since everybody everybody in this call here has an interest in telema, and you usually hear it from me, like you, as I say many times, you hear my my experience of telema, what what I understood of telema over my years into into the um, into the current, really. I I felt that you know one year into the building of this community, it's very good for you all to start hearing different sounds, different voices, not just me, because if not, it it's so easy for these communities to become. Um, a place where you know what the guru, the master, can never be challenged, can never be uh, like everything he says is is golden. And um, while I would love that, uh, it's also not good for initiation per se. Uh, you have you have to hear the same different voices. Uh, of if course, you meet the Buddha on the road, kill him. <laughs> uh, there, there, some of them are coming here in Glastonbury. <laughs> no, if I if I'm dead, then <laughs> uh, you this is going to be recorded for a day. So uh, okay. All right, um, let's start with a little bit of things that I kind of prepared, I'm kind of prepared. I mean, um, kind of. Uh, what I would like, okay, first of all, Rodney, you are writing a book. I mean, Rodney, you, you wrote already different books already, Abrahadabra, The Grimoire of Alistair Crowley, which are books that we are planning to go into a book club about, especially The Grimoire of Alistair Crowley. Yeah, that's, I know, right? It's crazy. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. That's, yeah, so it makes it worth coming along to hear that. <laughs> Uh, but you are writing a new book right now with Phil. Mm -hmm. uh, with Phil Hine. Yeah. Tell us a little bit of how you get to know Phil. I mean, lots of people here know about Phil uh, uh, because many, many, let's say, new magicians, uh, usually they um, their first um, interaction with magic is through chaos magic. I mean, I guess it's mm -hmm. a common story. And so, of course, Phil Hine's book became pretty much the first port of call. Mm -hmm. Why don't you tell us a little bit, first of all, how you got to know Phil and how, what are you doing together? So what is this? Okay, book? so I, I'm, I'm, in case you're wondering where this weird accent is from, I'm originally from Northern Ireland. I grew up in, in the Irish countryside. And when I was, a, and in the middle, Northern Ireland had a big war going on then. So in my early, when I was 20, I think, I hitchhiked to England and to make a new life for myself, which is packed everything I had in a rucksack and just took off. And I didn't know anybody or anything in the UK or in England, nobody. I didn't know where to go. The only thing I knew about in England was a shop called the Sorcerer's Apprentice, which was the first ever big occult store, right? It was like an occult mail order store and they were based in Leeds in the North of England. So I hitchhiked there because it was the only place I knew about. I'd, I'd ordered some magic books from there, you know, when I was a teenager. Uh, and, uh, and so that I ended up in Leeds. And a lot of other kids around that period ended up in Leeds due to the gravitational attraction of this store called The Sorcerer's Apprentice. And, um, and we ran, uh, some of us got together and we formed an occult society uh, at Leeds University. We got the student union, Leeds University student union finances to build a student occult society. And we held lectures every, every week and all sorts of stuff. It was kind of crazy time, but it was really cool. And um, Chaos Magic had just started then. 
um, Ray Sherwin, two guys started, Ray Sherwin and Pete Carroll. Most people know about Peter Carroll because of Lieber No, which mm -hmm. is a great book. Unfortunately, the succeeding books are so good. progressively less good, shall we say. Um, uh, Rodney, but, but, a second. Uh, but there's, I'm, yeah, I'm, come on. What I love about Rodney is that he is as blunt as I am, if not more. So be prepared for that. And that's good. It, it's, it's a race to the bottom with, with <laughs> us, isn't it, Marco? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so um, so there were two guys that actually started, a guy called Pete Carroll, who most people know about, another guy, that, and they shared a house together near Leeds, and the other guy was called Ray Sherwin, who also wrote a couple of really great, The Illuminates of Thana Terrace, the original IOD, yes. And, and Ray wrote a couple of great books that have sadly just seemed to have vanished. And he wrote one called Theatre of Magic, yeah, which yeah. was about dramaturgy and, and magic and magical ritual. And he wrote one called The Book of Results which was the first book that really took the Austin Spare system and codified it into a really working system. Because if you read Spare's original books, they're like, yeah. they're, they are chaos in the worst sense of the word. Um, and so these books were very uh, meaningful for us. And, and I got to meet them. Uh, the very first day I turned up in Leeds, uh, the Source Apprentice had a little tea room and I sat down there and sitting beside me was Pete Carroll and a bunch of other like, Guys. we sat there all day long just drinking tea and chatting about the, about magic and uh when they shut the tea room at like six o'clock or whatever a couple of the other guys said where are you going to now and i said i don't know i'm homeless i have nowhere to go i don't know where i'm going and they said oh why don't you just come and stay with us so i ended up couch surfing at, a, at an address called four Asheville avenue four aa uh in leeds and and that's how I ended up there. I ended up staying, and the whole house it was a big shared house, just full of occultists, all experimenting with magic, and and we became the original IOT. Um, that's how the, the we we joined. That was the first chaos magic group, really, in Leeds, and that was before Phil was even into chaos magic. So, um, so if you've read Peter Carroll's Psychonaut, a lot of the stuff in Psychonaut is stuff that that I was actually involved with back then. I'm one of the people dedicated, I believe. Anyway, so then one day later, many months later, this guy I vaguely knew turned up at my door and to introduce me to this guy who I thought I might want to know. They just knocked on my door and said, hey, Rodney, this is a guy called Phil. You might want to, I think you guys should talk. And Phil was organizing one of the first big global meditation things. It was a thing called Heal the Earth. It was like a global ritual. Uh, for ecological purposes. And I just thought this was the coolest fucking thing I'd ever seen. The idea that someone, some kid in Leeds could just say, let's get the whole world doing a ritual together. Uh, and But Phil didn't know how to quite uh, market this idea. So we asked if I could help him. So we started chatting, blah, blah, blah. And then it turns out he was part of a group called Pagan Link, mm -hmm. which was the first sort of group in trying to get pagans to talk to each other. Um, because this is pre-internet, you got to remember. I'm really what, fucking old. What, what day was? What year was this? This know. is eighty-seven, maybe. I, I was. Um, I was nine in eighties. Yeah, I know. I'm so fucking old. <laughs> anyway, fucking old. So anyway, so um, so anyway, so Phil and I started chatting, and he was he was just he wanted to do this magazine. He wanted to do a little magazine, and I said, "Well, I've got a computer, and we can." You know, I was one of the few people that had a computer because I was a musician. I had a studio. And I said, yeah, I'll help you out with it. And, and that's how we started. And so we started a magazine called Pagan News, mm -hmm. which rapidly became the biggest pagan magazine ever, really, I think. I mean, we had thousands of issues every month. Uh, and we were reporting on everything, everything to do with, and we, 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 for us, paganism was a really broad church. It was everything, Satanists, Stalemites, Buddhists, whatever, we didn't give a shit. If you were doing something weird and Christians didn't like it, you were in, you know, uh, and, and that became like a, a really compulsive purchase. So that's by all a long way of getting back to what we're doing now, because the new book is we run pagan news every month for five years. And the new book is a compilation of that five years of magical history uh, of everything that happened in the late 80s and early 90s and, the, and one of the things that was that we hit that we accidentally well kind of accidentally stumbled upon i was one of the first people to ever have an internet connection that i know of in fact the only the first person i ever met with an internet connection wait a second, um, wait a second. What, what what year was that what year was that? this is in the early late 80s 
Okay, yeah, you, you won. I, my first internet connection was on a BBS in 1992. Yeah, exactly. So we, <laughs> had, we, we were logging into BPSs and BBSs and shit. And we actually, one night, just bouncing around on the proto internet, we found uh, a couple of Christian BBSs that had all these documents posted about satanic abuse. And we were like, what? This is hilarious. What is this shit? And we started downloading it and reading it. And then we were horrified because there was this massive underground conspiracy going on of all these people, like uh, uh, all these hardcore right wing Christians who were pushing this whole satanic ritual abuse myth. And they were pushing it to social services, law enforcement, everywhere, all across America, all across the UK, and trying to get it. And, and we were just like, holy shit this is this is this is terrifying so we started telling we started writing about it and telling people hey guys watch out we're in a lot of trouble here and people were like don't be stupid nothing's going to happen um yeah uh so i think by, by the time we finished we we spent five years reporting on this every every month and we ended up we were pagan news became so influential like we would see uh like when, when the TV cameras were, were interviewing people about these things, like MP, you know, members of parliament or journalists or whatever, we'd see copies of Pagan News lying on their desk in the background. So, um, you know, it, this, we and, and so we ended up becoming the voice of reason, you know, uh, against this whole thing. Uh, and because everyone else was just shit scared. Everyone ran for cover. And, and I don't blame them in a lot of ways, because if you were a parent, I mean, we didn't have kids, you know, we were young, we were kids ourselves. Uh, but if you were a, if you had a family and you were a pagan, you were in trouble. You were terrified. I mean, I think ninety six kids got taken away from their parents in the UK alone in that five year period, right? Taken away from their parents. I know one of them now. I know he's now growing up. Two of them, in fact. Um, do, you, do you think? And, do yeah, you, go on. Do you think that uh, whatever we've been experiencing in the last few years, right? You know. The rise of QAnon that mm -hmm. we, and you, we were actually discussing, if, if you remember back in when, we, when I was DJing in Dublin many years ago, mm -hmm. I was completely drunk, of course, as usual. But, <laughs> but uh, do you think that whatever, how, how, how that narrative has unfolded in the last few years, are we going to go back to the same kind of absolute crazy satanic panic that you are describing? Yeah, yeah, absolutely we are. That's one of the reasons why we're doing the book. Mm -hmm. uh, we wanted to to compile all that stuff that we did back then uh, and put it out now because I think it's actually more important now than ever that people can see that this shit comes around, you know, uh, over and over again. I mean, and it wasn't new if you think about it. I mean, the, this whole thing about sacrificing babies, and it's what they used to say about the Jews in the 17th century. Yeah. You know, it's it's the classic, it's the classic bullshit you know, uh, conspiracy theory. And it comes around over and over and over again. And it's just more, it's just a bunch of people using religion for authoritarian control. Uh, and it's going to keep on happening unless you, unless you stop it. Now, we were, we were lucky in that we stumbled upon it and we didn't give a shit mm -hmm. and, and we could write. So yeah. we, we totally, we, you know, our, Pagan News was super sarcastic and hilarious. It was really humorous. I mean, I, I, when, when we first started it, I mean, most occult magazines back then and still today were like, you know, had some cover of some wispy elven woman wandering across the, 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 the Barrow Downs in a Lord of the Rings style thing or whatever. And then had some pagan poetry about, hey, ho, the merry -o, uh, you know, and all this kind of crap. And we hated that shit. Uh, and so, you know, before we wrote, we, we had this big manifesto of all the stuff we weren't going to do and, and, uh, and the stuff we were. And so we wanted to build something that was really hard heading, really tight, economical, no bullshit, long articles about whatever personal Deep idiocy that. somebody had, whatever we would. Uh, and we would absolutely take the piss out of everything that needed the piss taken out of, which was a lot of stuff. Um, and we had a lot of humor in it. I mean, we had a, we, we, one of our friends uh, wrote for us for years under the name of his pseudonym was Barry Hairbrush. And people thought it was either me or Phil. It wasn't, we're not that funny. But he wrote, he did this series of cartoons every month. We had one called Famous Awkward Stereotypes. And he'd do like a little cartoon and a little speech. Like one of them was Gravington Gr Gore Cruelly Bore, um, uh, for example. And there was uh, Meredith, yeah. Meredith Muir, His Cult's Quite Obscure. Uh, 
or I, Gladys I, Twitch, traditional witch. Wait, um, I, I have the, I have these cartoons, and I'm gonna put them uh, on screen when uh, <laughs> the video is. It, yeah, it, and and, he, and Barry also wrote. Uh, we we sort we 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 would serialize his novellas, so he wrote one called uh, Barry Hairbrush and the Tentacles of Naughtiness, which was a Cthulhu pastiche. And then there was a Dennis Wheatley pastiche called The Computer Rides Out. Uh, and, uh, you know, and so... Can we find these, these things a lot? You'll find them in the new book. <laughs> That's book. it. Fantastic. So, 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 uh, so we thought we'd compile this book. And I ended up, I've been writing it for months now, like every day for months. And you might wonder, how can you be writing it every day for months if it's a co compilation of five years of other stuff? And that's because I'm footnoting it like, Oh my God, the footnotes. There's more footnotes than there is text now because what I'm, because a lot of the people we were talking about then are dead now. So we can really say what we think <laughs> you know, because you can't libel the dead. Um, and also, like, you know, we, we were able to actually see, you know, looking back 25 years later, we can look back and go, like, well, what was really going on here? How did what happened to this person? Why did this, why did they do this? What was the background? And so we're analyzing it and also being really snarky again. Um, so, like, for example, one of my one of my favorites was there, was there was a guy that we used to take the piss at all the time called Jeffrey Dickens, who was a British member of parliament, big fat, slimy guy, who was one of the he was always in parliament talking about Satanists, you know, destroying our way of life with whatever. And I, I took a great, a great joy in writing about him because, you know, what later happened was, for example, it was found out that he was having an affair with a secretary or something. And his wife only found out when she turned on the TV and saw him doing a press conference about it. Um, so that, that's a, that was the great moral crusader of, of Parliament. Um, I mean, certain things never change because, I mean, look at whatever happens. In yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so the thing is, the book's going to be... Even though it's just the best off the magazine, the book, I think it's going to be about 400 pages of stuff. And it's like, I, I'm really loving writing it because it's like a sociological and esoteric history of magic in the 80s and 90s. Uh, and it's, it's, it's real history. And I remember like sitting in a pub like in the late 89 or whatever with a bunch of occultists back then. Uh, and someone was like saying, you know, Oh, wouldn't it have been great to live back in the days of the golden dawn or blah 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 and i'm like we are living in those days people are like what do you mean i said that this is history we're making it right now and, and people just laughed but hey it turns out that's what yeah. we did and, and so i'm I, so what i want to do if you look at history books about the occult they all end in about 1950. yeah you know boof and and then for the second half of the 20th century there's nothing but there was a lot going on. So it's so that's basically what I'm trying to do is write like a, a history of the late 20th century magic, if you like. This is great because actually, well, first of all, uh, well, I, I'm pretty sure that you will keep me informed when it's out and then we're going to... It won't be until the start of next year, I think, because it's also going to be full of photographs and illustrations and it's going to be a massive layout job. So, uh, can you but us? it's coming out on Strange Attractor Press, right, which means cool. that in America, it's coming out on MIT Press. Rock and roll. <laughs> we got academic credibility, baby. <laughs> like that. Uh, question number two. Am I moving on to that? That was only question number one. Jesus. <laughs> That's, well, I, I, I know that uh, inviting you, you would do all the job because you like to talk, all right, mate, don't you? <laughs> I like that. Who, me? Me? <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, uh, no. I mean, first of all, thank you so much for that because, again, uh, folks, I mean, you've, you've seen it. Like, we are just, we're pretty much you know bringing on the torch for people came before us and people come before us we're having fun apart from yeah, so we just heard so one question here now next um mm -hmm. what do you think has changed in the magic community like in the wider magic community okay well it's a lot wider yeah that's one thing that's changed it's a hell of a lot wider i mean again you got on something like when i first got interested in crowley um you couldn't get a crowley book yeah you just couldn't you know, I mean, I see people in the internet today complain about such and such a Crowley book has been out of print for three years. Whoa, big fucking deal. You know, when, when I was getting interested in Thalema at 14 or whenever, I mean, I started really early. I mean, most of this stuff had been out of print for 50 years. Yeah. And even then, the original print run was like 75 copies or something. So getting hold of an occult book at all was just uh, really, really difficult. Mm -hmm. um, 
So I used to hunt secondhand bookstores all over. I mean, my, my greatest my greatest thing that slipped through my fingers was being offered a cop a first edition Moonchild for twenty five pounds in the secondhand shop, and I only had twenty quid, and he wouldn't take the twenty pounds. <laughs> He's going to show off his book collection now. God. You mean this one? Yeah, that exact one. Yes. Yes, that it's one. It's Rian's, by the way. It's not mine. It's... <laughs> well, yeah, of course it is. <laughs> um, anyway, so yeah, but so it was information was very difficult to come by. And it's the exact opposite these days. I mean, just there's information everywhere. I mean, you know, that, which is great. Don't get me wrong. I think it's amazing. But that brings its own problems. You've got to wade through, you know, head, head high bullshit. Uh, and most of the, I mean, I mean, one thing has not changed. And that is that 95% of everything written and said about the occult is total bullshit. And of the other 5%, 4.999% of that is sort of interesting, you know? This and actual good. really good information is still is still super rare uh, as a percentage, so but there's a lot more of it. I so, could say that that hasn't changed. Like you know the yeah. the the the, the, qu the quality versus quantity. I mean, there's <laughs> quantity, but the quality is still different. So, okay, yeah. uh, that's that's a good thing. Um, how do you think? I mean, do you think that actually the having all this approach about you know occult influencers instagram occult uh, is the, is this the devaluing the the message no 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 i don't think so at all no I, quite the opposite i think it's great don't get me wrong i can say there's a lot of bullshit out there but i'd still rather have loads of bullshit with 0.1% if it, as long as it's 0.1% great the more bullshit there is the more good stuff there is and yeah. that's fine there are there is some good stuff out there and it's just incumbent upon people like us to make people aware of what is good and what isn't you've got to be you you i mean you, you've got to be train your senses you've got to train your your critical faculties to be able to go well this makes sense or this doesn't you yeah. know and, and also not fall into the classic ego trap this makes me feel good therefore it must be right <laughs> you know that's also you know <sighs> I mean, that's, a, that's what we discuss many times together, like the fact that a lot of people get into the occult or magic or whatnot in order to have ego trips. And I guess for people like me and you, it's always be easier not to have that. We, are, we have had our ego trips on, uh, in front of people on stages, right? <laughs> but... <laughs> like, uh, I, mean, I, I mean, I've been accused of being egotistic many times, and I would never possibly attempt to deny it. Um, yeah, I mean... As I was mentioning earlier, ego is a great servant and a terrible master. You know, what's great about ego is that you can use it to fuel what you really need to do. The, the ego is a, is a great energy. It's a, I mean, it's what, I mean, when I was a kid, I was super shy. I was so shy. I, you could barely say a word without like going bright red. And, you know, I was terribly, terribly shy. But then I just I real I discovered you know rock and roll music and I wanted to be a musician and I sat down and thought about this and thought well if I want to be a musician and be and and succeed at it and and well do I want to succeed at it yeah because I want to make music and if I want to keep making music I need to make some money so I need to be successful and if I need to be successful I need to be able to go out there and relate to people so I so that ego drive to be a successful musician drove me to create the person I am. And that's great. Now, it? there were times, I'll freely admit, there were times that turned me into a total jerk off. I mean, you were, I mean, in my 20s, I was a jerk and a half. Um, but uh, I mean, but I, it I, got I, me I, where I, I am today, so I that's can okay. Possibly, I can possibly confirm or deny Yeah, that. you couldn't possibly confirm or deny it. Uh, yeah. One question that from the ego, then. Uh, moving more into, into strict up till I'm in territory now. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you think that the ego, do you think that you guys anything to do with, you know, Tiferet and the Holy Guardian Angel and the True Will? Oh, God. <laughs> yes, I got you. <laughs> tell me, tell me what you think about that. <laughs> okay. How many hours have we got? That's um, um, it's okay. <laughs> okay. So, like, um, a, a, few, a, a few years ago, um, I was having a discussion on Facebook, like, as you do, uh, and uh, about Christianity. And I was like, you know, most people, most Christians don't even know what Christianity is. Most of them don't even know what they believe. 
And somebody said, what, what, you know, what do you mean by that? And I'm like, so I published this thing called five things you didn't know weren't in the Bible. Right. So things like hell, not in the Bible. Right. Um, things like uh, people in heaven, not in the Bible. People don't go to heaven. That's not in the Bible. Everyone who's dead is dead. If you're a Christian, you believe, every, you know, they, they always say, well, you know, granny's gone to a better place now. No, she hasn't. According to the Bible, she's still on the ground. And people, don't, except for the prophet Ezekiel, who got translated directly to heaven in a chariot of fire, everybody else is still on the ground. That's what the Bible says. And they're not going to rise until Jesus comes back to earth. So, yeah, and blah, blah, blah. Right. Anyway, um, and even then, only 144,000 of those are only going to get into heaven. And they're all male virgins. So if you're a woman or you've had sex, you're not going to heaven. That's what the Bible says. Um, That's true. So I, so I published this and some people thought it was funny. And someone said, I bet you can't do one about Thelema. So I did five things you won't believe aren't in the book of the law. Challenge accepted, right? As soon as someone says, I bet you can't do that. I'm like, oh, yeah, hold my, hold my ginger beer. Um, so I wrote five things you don't believe in the, uh, aren't in the Bible. I wrote the Holy Guardian or, and the book of the law, Holy Guardian Angel. I wrote, this idea is so absurd, no one would ever believe in it anyway. And oh my God, the blogosphere, the occult blogosphere exploded <laughs> with, with all of these, you know, really serious Thelemites going about, how dare you say that the Holy Guardian Angel is absurd? It's the very foundation of our whole system. You know, out, out, outrage, outrage, burn the heretic, you know. They were coming around with a book, book of the law in one hand and a pitchfork in the other, you know. Uh, uh, and I let this go on, go on, go on from days and days and days, let people rant about it. And then I eventually wrote, wrote a reply and said, actually, I didn't say the Holy Guardian Angel is absurd. And people were like, oh, of course you did. It says right here. And I'm like, no, that wasn't what I said. That was me quoting somebody else. And that somebody else is Alistair Crowley, who wrote himself that the Holy Guardian Angel is a concept so absurd that no intelligent person would ever take it seriously. Uh, let me stop you there for a second. I'm going to read this because uh, what Crowley actually precisely wrote is, let me, let me clear this work under this title, The Obtaining the Knowledge and Conversation of the Holy Guardian Angel. Because the, the theory implied in this word is so patently absurd that only simpletons would waste much time in analyzing it. It would be accepted as a convention, and no one would incur the great danger of building a philosophical system upon it. Right. So I quoted that exactly from Crowley. And oh my God, it was like, you could have heard a pin drop for the next two days. Like, my favorite sort of like, ah. Uh... So, but anyway, so so that's that's my that's my thoughts on the Holy Garden. I agree with Alistair Crowley, completely absurd idea. Anyway, um, ego and will are two different things completely i mean one of the other things i wrote in that and the reason i'm going through this is one of the other things i wrote in that five things you will believe in the book of the law is true will mm -hmm. the concept of true will is not in the book of the law at all that's a cruelly invention okay mm -hmm. so if you think that the lame is about what's in the book of the law which as a religious idea you know let's 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 assume for the sake of argument that the religious boundaries of the lemma are defined by the book of the law right i mean you can argue beyond that but let's take that as a, as a as a working hypothesis for the purpose of the discussion um then it's not in the book of the law the book of the law talks about pure will now i didn't realize and i read the book of the law a thousand fucking times before i realized that and uh, and it was only when i i met a guy called tim maroney who was the very first guy, the very first Thelemite I ever met on the internet. When the internet started, there were three Thelemites on the internet, right? There was a guy called Neil Johnson, who worked at Apple, who, who, programmed, who designed the first modem for Apple. Oh, wow. And there was a guy called Tim Maroney, who was the project manager of OS8 for the Mac, oh, wow. right? And there was me. And there was a guy, and then later we were joined by a guy called Max Delisid, who who later ended up becoming, you'll love this, chief security officer. And I won't say who, I won't say what he did. Anyway, I won't say what he did, but anyway. Uh, but we were all, we were the first Thelemites on the internet. Uh, and uh, and I, I was like old gung ho. So I remember writing on this, on this uh, Alt Magic was, was the first uh, magical group on the internet. It's called Alt Magic. And I wrote this big long thing about Thelema at one point and was very proud of myself. And then this guy called Tim Maroney wrote a reply 
and just trash me completely, absolutely flame me so hard, like just demolished me. And I literally cried myself to sleep that night. I was so upset, right? It was the first troll, the first magical troll on the internet was Tim Maroney and me, on me. I, well, I'd never seen anything like it. I'd never, I'd never been talked to that harshly before. And, and I, I was, it was, I mean, I'm sure some people have been, have been flamed on the end. You, you know how it feels, right? It's horrible. And, and I literally cried myself to sleep. I was so upset. And then the next morning I woke up and I looked at what Tim had written. And then I replied, thanking him, saying thank you because he was right and I was wrong. And I was really happy that somebody had taken the time and energy to help me to understand. And, and Tim wrote back and he was like completely shocked. He was like, oh my God, no one's ever thanked me for flaming them on the internet before. And I'm like, well, here you go. And, what, and so, what, what, what did he say about what, what's the, so what? I, can't, I, can't, I honestly can't remember uh, the, that discussion. But later, but later on, I met Tim in, in San Francisco when I played there. And he was in the front row of the audience, like going crazy. And I didn't even know who it was. But we started chatting. And one of the things we, we spent the whole night laying on the boot of his car after the gig on the beach in, uh, in California, talking about Salema. Uh, and one of the things he mentioned was this concept that true will was in the book of the law. Um, this is, I, I'm sorry, I'm going all around the, no, no, that's great. That's the great. background of this. Yeah, go for it. And, anyway, so um, and I was like, really? And he said, yeah, it talks about pure will. And he said, I would argue, and this is his argument, that pure will is closer to the Chinese idea of the Tao De, uh, of the fact that you're, uh, than Crowley's thing. Because if you read someone like Diary of a Drug Fiend by Alistair Crowley, Diary of a Drug Fiend is a whole book about, as a novel based on Crowley's theories of the true will. And, and the hero of the novel, like, you know, he takes cocaine, he's a white privileged asshole. He, He's a real drug addict and he goes to Cr the Crowley figure to get cured of his drugs mm -hmm. and he ends up getting cured of his addictions because he becomes aware that his true will is to be an airplane engineer and he designs airplanes and thus he doesn't need cocaine anymore it's like uh, the the most stupid drug fantasy you've ever seen in your life you know um and but 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 that that point of view was that the true will is this one thing that you have to strive for, and once you achieve that one thing, everything is perfect, right? And what Tim described to me then, and what I realized then was the truth was that it's not this one special thing you have to achieve; it's a continuous process of harmonizing yourself with the universe. You know, like it says in the book of the law, for pure will, honest wage, the lost result is in every way perfect, or whatever the book is. Don't don't quote me on that. Read the book. Um, it was delivered from the last of results so, in every way perfect. Yeah, delivered from the lost result. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. Exactly. Um, and so yeah, I and and that hit me like a thunderbolt that that yes, it's not this thing. It's not this conscious uh, uh, achievement. This this idea of attainment. You know, that you attain to Buddhahood or enlightenment or whatever. It's not that. It, 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 that's, that's just nonsense. What it is, it's, it's a, a continual process of opening yourself to the universe, understanding it, and being yourself within your environment. Understanding your environment, being the person you need to be from one moment to the next. Uh, and it's not something that you that your ego figures out and then you're going, oh, my God, I got it. Yes, I'm perfect now. I have I have I'm so perfect. I no longer have an ego. Woo look at me. Um, <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's a, that happens a lot on Discord in these days. So I should invite you to to tell him accord one day. It's a beautiful place. Uh, that it's called like the slime of the pit. So you get in there, and if you stay on the score, like your ego explodes and you become a magus uh, and you cross the abyss. That's how fabulous, fabulous, fabulous. More uh, power to them. Anyway, uh, um, anyway, so so that that's my kind of idea. And and if you read, I mean, to me, one of the best Salemi books I've ever written is the Tao Te Ching, which is predates the Lama by what two thousand years, three thousand years, whatever. Uh, and Crowley's version of that Crowley's uh, version of, well it's it's Crowley's retranslation of the leg of translation is a brilliant book I mean I, I love Crowley's version of it I think it's really excellent I think Crowley, Crowley really nailed it and and if you read his Crowley's the, the other thing that uh, that when I did Grimoire of Alistair Crowley I think it, one of the things that I want to do in that book 
that I don't think anyone's really showed before is that Crowley changed his mind on stuff. <laughs> if you, most people will, you know, if, will, will, if they want to prove something is thalamic, they'll get, they'll get pull out a Crowley quote from their ass and go, well, Crowley said this, therefore that's what Crowley thought. But Crowley lived like for 75 years, whatever, you know, I can't remember what age was Crowley when he died, whatever. I can't remember, 40, well, 60, he, for 60, 71, something like that. Because he was born in 75 and died in 47. I'm telling yeah, right. Whatever the fuck age he was, he was old. And he was smart and he changed his mind like smart people do. Yeah. Uh, and so some of the things that Crowley wrote at one stage of his life are very different than other stages of his life. And also there were those things he wrote in, in, in fits of temper or uh, while he was coked out of his brain or whatever, uh, or on whatever cocktail of drugs he was taking, he wrote something in his diary that never was meant to be for public, yeah, yeah, <laughs> to, to, for public information. And people are still quoting it like it's gospel. Fuck that shit. Uh, so one of the things I wanted to show in Gromar of Oz to Crowley was that there was progression in his thought. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the later works of Crowley, like Eight Lectures on Yoga or Little Essays Towards Truth, uh, they're very philosophical. He's got a much more Taoistic and a much uh, uh, way of looking at things than he does in his very early works, which are much more based on Western white man hermeticism. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Uh, just to to round up this 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 section before opening, mm -hmm. or, another three more things that are not in the book of the law. We might have a discussion about that. Oh God. It's reincarnation. By the way, d d d the other thing to remember is this five things that are not in the book of the law. People these days seem to think it's some kind of manifesto I wrote. It was a joke, people. <laughs> Uh, uh, let me get there. Because, okay, another three things that are like reincarnation, magic, and Babylon. I think we discussed yeah. that Babylon is not in the book of the law. Uh, right. you know what's funny is that I'm looking at, the, at, your, at your article here on Telemic Union, and there's, there's only two, two comments. One is fine. The other is a serious telemite <laughs> arguing about point by point. And I'm like, yeah, that never changed. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, um, there's a question. I know that there's a couple of questions from the floor. Mm -hmm. uh, what was for Peter? Peter, you want to ask the question directly? So, sorry. Sure. sure I, I, was, I was thinking, um, you know, based on your, your musical career and your magical career, I wondered uh, sort of what lessons you've learned between the, the intermixing of those, how they feed off each other. Does one inform the other more Abs balanced? Fabulous. Fabulous question. Yes. The answer is absolutely 100% yes. I mean, for, you know, I, I realized very early on, I think that, that for most people, you know, um, that musicians are, are take a shamanic function in society, you know, in a lot of ways. Um, and, and again, this is something I could literally read a whole book on, but, um, but yeah, I mean, uh, if you ever see I don't know if Mark has ever seen me live. Or anybody's ever seen the live concerts? Can I? It's a very shamanic kind of thing. I, I'm very conscious of the fact that there's a magic flowing through me. You know that w when a performance is great, it's it goes beyond me. It goes beyond my ego and myself, and it becomes something energy, an energy that something bigger than me goes through me. And that's really great. I mean, I wrote an album called Sun God. It's a solo album um, that was actually based on voodoo and Santa Maria. Uh, and that was very deliberate because, um, you know, I was brought up, uh, and I say I grew up in, in Ireland. I ne never worked with any other magicians or anyone else. Didn't really know anybody, you know, for a long time. Um, yes, you can ask questions off the question, yes. Um, um, and when I was, I don't know, late 20s, early 30s, I began to realize that all the magic I'd done was me, was about me. It was me on my own in my bedroom, the magic circle painted on a carpet or whatever. And it was me, 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 me. And I realized I'd got to the point where for my own development, I needed to relate to other people. And I needed to read more to the outside world. And it was music. It was being on stage and, and relating to people. It was really, well, I really need to get my magic, my, my official magic, if you like, needs to also work in a way where it's really well to people because otherwise my ego is going to kill me. You know, uh, you, uh, and, you, and also I needed somebody or something to give me a, a kick up the pants, uh, give me a, a reality check. 
Because the problem with working on your own is you can go down some very dark rabbit holes where you think you're doing something fabulous. When you, all you need is someone to slap you upside the head and go, don't be a fucking idiot. You know, that's, that's not what's happening. Um, and so, so I started getting very interested in voodoo and I flew out to New Orleans and started doing voodoo practices there and got initiated in Santa Maria in New York because I wanted to get away from this white man's Christianity kind of influence magic where it's some guy standing in a, in a pulpit every day telling you what's right and what's wrong. And, and I think a lot of Western hermeticism still suffers from that unconscious Christian yeah. uh, influence. Uh, and so I wanted to be around a bunch of black people playing music and having a community and doing things that were real. And it was fabulous. It was fucking great. It was the best thing I ever did in my life. Um, it was really good. I mean, when I, when I first turned up in New York, I was the only white guy in the building. Uh, and it was like, and it was just full of black guys and brown guys with prison tattoos and stuff like that. And doing this incredible stuff, just this amazing magic. And, or like when I was in the voodoo temple in New Orleans, there were, you know, people would be dancing around doing magic for hours and hours and hours and hours. People would walk in, people would come in with their dogs and they eat sandwiches, sit, pull up a chair and eat a sandwich. Well, it was, just, it was just normal. Yeah. It, it, like you said, uh, like, in, my yeah. in, in Hoodoo as well, in Hoodoo as well, it's so much more, it, there's no difference between, you know, the, the, the sacred space and, and the normal space. Everything is a sacred space. You're constantly, exactly. You're yeah. Engaging with that. Uh, Zach, what question do you have out of, out of this one? So I have, I have like a very similar experience with going to Louisiana and finding something very mystical about like the other world, the macabre of Louisiana. Um, I, I love there. Do you find a similarity between um, the study of music and the study of magic, both in traditional and non-traditional ways, like the, the scholarly pursuit of magic that kind of echoes something that you would find in a university versus more like the, the practical, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, maybe something you would learn, learn in a lodge, being more akin to, you know, going to an open mic or a jam session mm, or right. being in a band with people vastly better than you are. <laughs> yeah, that's three of my life, man. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, when it comes to like the scholarly pursuit of magic, I'm not a huge fan of it in general. I mean, I think it's a good thing that it happens. Because it is good that, that we have people who can really give us the, the, the correct translations of things and the correct and, and, and archive stuff and so on. That's really great. Though I find most scholarly articles written about magic to be utterly shite. Um, likes most scholarly articles written about music, also utterly shite. Um, and my wife has a degree in music and I used to lecture in music at a college, but um, <laughs> uh, so, so I know what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> so anyway, but yeah, but really for me, it's always been uh, about reality. It's always been about doing, I mean, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, I've got lots and lots of books. I got a whole library in the next room full of occult books. Uh, and and I love reading and I love, I, and I, you know, I have no problem with the armchair magician. If you can do magic and stay in your armchair, you're a fucking better magician than most people. Um, but uh, I, I, I'm, I'm reading is a good thing. But at the end of the day, uh, you, the rubber has to hit the road. Uh, it's what you do that counts. Uh, and and you know uh, and a, a bunch of kids sitting in a in a, a a temple in New Orleans with a dog wandering around eating a sandwich are doing fucking great magic, really great magic. And it's a community thing. It's a real thing. You know, you know, like I used to sit around and listen to Western occultists argue about how many angels can get in the head of a pin. Kind of occult. Is this like this or is this like that? Is this thing really real or whatever? And then you go in a voodoo temple and the guy in front of you, the eyes roll back in his head and suddenly his voice changes and he's speaking with, you know, as, as uh, you know, whatever, um, or goon or whatever. And suddenly all intellectual questions of how real is this just go out the window because it doesn't matter because the God is standing in front of you talking to you. You're having a conversation with you in real 3D. 
Uh, and that was that was gigantic. That was brilliant. And and that to me is what really counts. I, I'm I'm about results. I'm about reality. Yeah. I, I'm about making shit happen. Um, but that, and that that's what's most important. Everything else is 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 a back is is the background to that. Yeah. But all the but but it's it's and it's an essential background. But it's just a background. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, uh, the next question, I think, was uh, Riyam had a question as well. Mm -hmm. um, my question is about Peter Carroll and how it was to work with him, because when you read the books, he just sounds like, oh, so serious and mysterious and like one liners. But I feel like underneath that, he probably was a bit boring and just ate sausage rolls all day. So what would <laughs> And I, I'd rather not talk about my personal relationships with people on a in a public forum because i don't think that's very respectful um and i've had my i've had my back and forth with peter you know and but i'll i'll, I'll say that liver no and psychonaut were both excellent works that were enormously influential on me and i think and after that dot 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 uh, I will only add this: that the only, the first time, the first and only time that I met Peter Carroll was in 2013, 2014, sorry, here in Glastonbury at the first um, cold conference, mm -hmm. and uh, I I go down at the Commonstead where I was staying, and who be old Peter Carroll was there eating a full, full English breakfast <laughs> because he would speak at the conference, and we had uh, we talked about food. <laughs> That's what we talked about. <laughs> That's probably the wise choice. <laughs> okay, there's one final question uh, from Tamarin. Um, final questions already? Oh my god! Uh, yeah, yeah, we've been we've been going on for a while already. Um, so uh, Tamarin is asking. Um, uh, I'm curious what Rodney thinks about. Uh, how yeah, I'm reading it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry, go on. Yeah, so I can read it for the recording. Yeah, yeah, go. Yeah. Uh, uh, what Rodney thinks about how Chaos Magician didn't put much focus on meditation. There was a lot of talk about gnosis, but not about yoga disciple. And I'm curious if coming from that community, uh, why then you broke off towards the lemma? Okay, that's that's an excellent question. I mean, I think I mean one of the things about the early Chaos Magicians is that it was very it was a, very much a punk movement. It was like it was like the punk movement in music. It was like let's just kick out all those boring bastards you know it was like it was like yes versus the sex pistols you know you didn't have to learn all those boring guitar solos and shit you just had to play three chords and, and scream loudly uh and and that's chaos we've really felt that way i think in the early chaos magic days it was like throw out all this other crap just get something that works get to the point make it happen um and and when it comes to you kick this on it you know i mean Things like the spare death posture, I guess, could be seen as a kind of yogic discipline. And that was very much part of the original chaos magic movement. But the other thing about chaos magic, it was very, very eclectic. Uh, ultimately, it was like, does it work? Great. Then we'll have it. Does it not work? Then I don't care what anyone thinks. We're not going to use it. It was all about, does this work? And also, it was very personalized. And does it work for you? Because what works for me and what works for you are two different things. So it's not for me to say, this is a good thing to do. Yeah, I can say, this, this has helped me. This is what it does to me. Try it and see what happens. Um, but I mean, uh, but the thing about breaking from Chaos Magic to Thelema, there was never, I'm, I was a Thelemite before I did Chaos Magic. And I didn't become less of a Thelemite when I was doing Chaos Magic because uh, it was the same thing. It was just part of my world. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was exploring and understanding myself and the magic that I was doing. And so that was perfectly thalamic as far as I was concerned. Other people's chaos magic may not have been, and other people's thalamic may not have been chaotic. That's okay. That's kind of the whole point of do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law, you know? It's the. Um, but I mean, but in the end, I mean, I ended up joining the OTO after that rather than the IoT, because I, I began to, I mean, the IoT, I was involved with the very first formation of the IoT, but I didn't end up joining because the when the IoT was starting, it was all about creating a non-hierarchical organization that would be, you know, grassroots and blah, 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 which is all very well. But immediately I started to say, I mean, I remember I went to a big meeting of a lot of early chaos magicians and they were talking about forming this working group. And there was a guy up the front telling us all about how it was going to be non-hierarchical. 
<laughs> right. Um, maybe this is a lesson here for um, that we're trying to do the same now. That's uh, yeah. That's a lesson here. Um, and so I realized the reason, that, one of the reasons I ended up joining the UTO is I thought, well, kind of all groups are going to end up hierarchical somehow just for them to operate, you know, because some people are going to do some things and some people are going to have responsibilities. So human beings tend to fall into hierarchical patterns for better or worse. Now, the science of organizations has become very interesting in the last couple of decades. Like, uh, I mean, I think the open source movement has a lot to teach us mm -hmm. about, and the ecological movements and so on, have a lot to teach us about how you can have proper bottom-up organizational patterns and how you can evade the traditional ego-driven and control-driven authoritarian structures. And again, that's a really big subject to go into. But one of the reasons I ended up joining the OTO was because it had a very strictly hierarchical organization that was very clearly marked and uh, marked out and had built in checks and balances. So I figured if I'm going to be an organization that's, uh, if any organization is going to be hier hierarchical, I may as well join one that gets it and, and, and is upfront about it and where everybody knows what the hell's going on rather than it being, hey, look, pal, don't worry, everybody's non-hierarchical here, I'm telling you. Um, of course, yeah. Rodney. You and that was one of the reasons I joined the UTO. The other reason I joined the UTO was because um, after all the satanic ritual abuse thing, one of the things that happened during the satanic ritual abuse thing was that uh, an OTO lodge in, California, in San Francisco was raided and everybody there was arrested. Um, and the UTO hired lawyers and fought a case and cost a quarter of a million dollars. And I thought to myself, well, if I was ever in trouble, what organization would spend a quarter of a million dollars to defend me? And there was only one choice. So it, again, it was a very practical choice. I was going to join an organization that could actually do something for me. Okay. Um, so that, that was the real reason why. I, uh, so. Of course, we're, 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 we're not going to go, I mean, uh, you're opening yourself to one question from me, and that's going to be the wrap it up. <laughs> do you think that uh, the OTO is still the same? That's a long question. I mean, uh, I, mean um, I think, uh, no, let, let, me, let, me, no, let, me, let me answer that very quickly. Uh, and, and I, I think, because I'm sure lots of, lots of people have questions about OTO stuff as well. And I was in the OTO for 29 years. 29 years, man. And as Marco said, I, got, I went the whole way. And, and I, was, I was head of the OTO in Germany. I was head of the OTO in Ireland. I was on the Supreme Grand Council of the UK. I was on the Supreme Grand Council of the USA. So yeah, I know the OTO pretty well. And, and I learned a lot of good things in the OTO. It was a great, great experience. And I had some terrible things happen to me in the OTO as well. But overall, it was a very, very, I learned a lot of good stuff and it was a very positive thing. But I think the thing, and, and, and one of the things I think, if I'm not trying to disagree with you here, Marco, I've read your stuff about your experience in the OTO and I absolutely would never say in any, I never try to disrespect your feelings or your opinions on this is totally fine. Um, but I think one of the things that people don't perceive, they, people perceive the OTO as one big monolithic organization, and it is not. It is actually split into regional groups. Every, every nation has its own OTO, and uh, own OTO lodge, Grand Lodge or local uh, national body. And those often have very different, depending on who's running them and how they're run, they're very different. So the OTO in the USA, for example, in my opinion, is a brilliant organization. And if I lived in the USA, I would still be in the OTO because the USA OTO is great and it's full of great people. Um, and, it, it, and it's run very, very well. The OTO, the, Mark, your, most of your experiences over here in the UK, not quite so great. And we will, <laughs> we will not go into more details about that. Yeah, no, I don't need to go into more details than that, but I just want to point out to people that that it's not a cut and dried, it's like this or it's like that black and white situation, you know? But so. do, you, do, you think, do you think there's still a value in joining orders these days or could we approach it in a more I, open source as you just mentioned it before? Because Yeah, I mean, 
I, mean, I got I did get a lot out of being in the OTO, like I said earlier. I got I got a lot out of it and I stayed there for 29 years and went through the whole system and I learned a lot and it made me the person I am and I'm very happy about that. Um and it gave me some great experiences and I met some of my best friends there, like you, Marco. I met you through the OTO. I, I met, you know, I met a lot of very a lot of most of the people who are close to my life, Londa Cat, for example. Wonder, Lon and Constance are wonderful people whom I absolutely love with all my heart. And, uh, you know, Father Sebastius and Sarah Helena, also a wonderful couple that I love deeply. Um, you know, and there's, there's some wonderful people there. And, and that was a very fulfilling experience. Uh, and, and so there's a, definitely a value. There's a value in having that human connection with people who under, get you. Yeah. You know? Um, I remember, like, uh, um, Grant Morrison uh, came to my wedding and uh, and the reception was full of occultists. I mean, it was like if you had thrown a hundred in there, it would have wiped out half the occult world in a second. But um, but I remember Grant coming up to me at like two, two on the clock in the morning going like, oh, Rodney, this is fucking amazing. I, no matter what I say to people, they understand me. <laughs> uh, and, and there's a value in in having a community that, that gets you, that, that you, that, that don't talk down to you or you don't have to talk down to them, you know, that, that where you can go like, you can say some really absurd thing and people go, go, oh my God, I know exactly what you mean. Um, and there's, there's a very strong value. And there's a value having people who can mentor you and can say, yeah, I get that because here's maybe why that's happening because this thing works like that. So you don't go, oh my God, I'm not completely crazy after all. Um, so there is a lot of value and there's a lot of value in the discipline and the ritual practice um because i mean like i although i come across as being a bit free from and chaotic when it comes to ritual i am fucking hitler you know i mean yeah, you've, I, I, I get yeah i mean you better be fucking we're perfect and be in the right place at the right time or you're in big trouble you okay. know i'm razor sharp about getting things done right you I'm know i I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap it up now because because we, we we've been going for a while. But I would say something. The first time I ever attended a Gnostic mass was here in London with you and Sul wow. you and Selena, a priest and priestess. And uh, it was, I mean, I at that point in time, I already had been member of DAA, uh, Telemai for 15 years. I've been doing all the things, but I never, and I was never interested in the ecclesiastical side of Telema. Mm -hmm. Rodney and Selena's mass sold it like completely because it was absolutely perfect. Like it was, of course, after that, I realized the difference of different performers, <laughs> something like that. But it was absolutely perfect. And in many ways, if I, if often I, I mean, whenever we discuss about how do ritual, right? Especially for those of you coming to Glasgow in, in the summer, Rodney, if you, if you don't know what to do in July, come along as well. Uh, for we, sure. Yeah, we're going to, we're going to try and, and, and nail like, you know, to perfect the feast, as they say, right? Mm -hmm. like, because at, as I say many times, like ceremonial magic has to be perfect or else you do sigils, you do meditations, you do things on, on yourself, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I would say that Rodney really taught me that lesson because, I mean, it, 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 you set up like a benchmark that, uh, I mean, I unfortunately, I eventually after I left the audio, I didn't have much time to perform the mass anymore, but I was always had that in my mind when I was doing priest uh, because like Rodney was Rodney's fucking good. <laughs> But then Thank I, you, <laughs> Rodney. That was a great mass. Was a great I still mass. remember it. It was very good. It was very, very good. But there's some pictures actually online of, especially of Selena, because she had this massive Isis, uh, um, like um, head, head, head piece. Huge headdress, yeah. With little birds hanging from it. Yeah, yeah it was. It was absolutely beautiful. Is it, uh, that's actually an original 1930s Shinto priestess. Outfit. I, I would I wouldn't I'd not expect anything less from Selena knowing her. Yeah, when, when when she walked in the room, you could heard a pin drop. It was like you just heard a <gasps> Yeah. <laughs> I mean I would like you had this in draw of breath and then like nobody exhaling for about a minute. It was like it was like, <gasps> it, was like <gasps> it was it was incredible. Anyway, it truly was the presence of the divine, and, and that's what it's about. Rodney, thank you so much for being part of this experience. Uh, like, I know, this uh, is Anusprechig and Rambling. <laughs> and I guess, I guess that we're going to wrap it up because we've been, we've been going for a while. And thank oh God, you. Yes.
all for coming tonight. I hope you learned something new. It's, as I said, it's so important to hear different voices. You always hear me. You've been hearing me 52 weeks, pretty much, uh, day in, day out. Uh, you, Rodney, poor only... people, you poor people. <laughs> I was about to say, Rodney is not only my friend, I will skip. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you for coming. And thank You're you. You're very welcome. Well, thank you guys for coming as well. And thank you for the the kind words I really appreciate it and feel free to friend me on your Twitter's book thing as well uh, and, and you know whatever and buy my books but uh, we will definitely we will definitely have the Grimoire well, and well if you're going to do a book club thing on Grimoire of Oscar Crowley or whatever feel free to invite me back and get it from the from the, the words of the master himself <laughs> uh, there's no ego right that's what we're saying. no we go here no definitely not um, uh, um, that's it. Do what the world shall be the hope, the hope. Love is the love. Love is the love, love, love. love.